Hi, everyone, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show where we discover the silver lining in life's most difficult stories. I'm your host, Toby Doerr. Susan, thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Fierce Conversations with Toby. Before we start, can you tell me your favorite color and why? All right. Hey, Toby. Um, Without a doubt, green. Uh, Yeah. I'm a fine artist. Oils are my favorite medium. And greens go on forever. Mm -hmm. I see uh, when I'm driving, for instance... I almost see as if it's a canvas, and I feel lucky <laughs> to to be so. Yes, lucky. to be that lucky. is. Yeah, I, I know. When I was painting in watercolor, I would be driving and I'd look at a tree and say, "Now, what colors would I mix to get the color of those leaves?" You know, or what colors would I mix to do that cloud? Absolutely. Because I just think colors are so. Beautiful, and we take them for granted sometimes. Indeed. But when you look at them with an artist's eye, and you think, "How would what would I mix to create that color?" It just makes it like a four D world. Are you still painting at all? Do you have time? I'm not. I wish I was. I haven't picked up painting again <clears throat> since I got out of prison, and I don't know why. Except that, you know, I don't have my paint, and paint is expensive, so. And I'm pretty particular about the brand of watercolors. I like Windsor and Newton, and they're expensive. And I just haven't, but I keep saying I'm going to pick it up again. And so maybe now's the time I should. I'm giving you homework. Yeah. I used to teach. Yes. That, that's your homework. Okay. All right. I accept. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll get something done. So it, I loved painting with watercolor. Now I think I paint with words more, but... Uh, you know, I still have a creative outlet, but it just isn't watercolor. But I'm going to give it a shot again. So Homework. Yes, homework. So, Susan, what's the hardest decision that you've ever had to make? You know, I've, I've obviously been thinking about this. Um, when I decided to leave my first marriage, ooh, um, yeah. it's, I just had a little catch in my throat. And it's been mm-hmm. like over 30 years ago. But mm-hmm. I knew I would be changing Jesse's life, my daughter, forever. And I had always wanted her to have the perfect childhood, as if mm-hmm. on and and doing that, and you know, well, that just crumbled for her. So, yeah, that's tough. You know, of course, I left my first marriage too, but in a very dramatic way. Uh, so it was obvious that I wanted to leave, but even knowing that I needed to leave did not make getting divorced easy. No. It's still like a big ripping apart of your life and everything you know, and it is a huge adjustment. You know, it shouldn't be called breaking up because that implies a quick break. It's more yes. like a taffy pull. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of like a, just a stretch into a new life. And it's, yes, definitely. that's right. I like that. I like that visualization. So tell us about a significant event in your life that knocked you down. And how did you pick yourself up? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I write about it in my book uh, uh, to some extent. And let's introduce your book here. So uh, I've introduced it in the introduction, but let's go ahead and talk. And there it is in your hands. So tell us a little bit about your book. It's called Rain Dodging. Rain Dodging, yes. A Scholar's Romp Through Britain in Search of a Stuart Queen. Wow. Um, I was lucky enough to have a term at Oxford when I was working on my second master's through the Breadloaf School of English. And Mm -hmm. I was um, introduced to Queen Mary of Modena. She was the queen consort to James II. And um, was James II Mary Stuart's son or was James I Mary Stuart's son? I mean that you know the yeah, Queen, Queen Mary. With the, no, no, yeah. it was James the first. James the second was the brother of Charles the second, the Mary monarch. Okay, and he was okay. Yeah, reigned for three years. He was deposed, and they fled to France. Um, but anyway, uh, so um, 
in the studies, I came across Mary of Modena, who had a female court of writers in the late 17th century. Wow. So unusual. Wow. And I wanted, I wanted to find out why. How did that come to be? So that was my quest. And the mm -hmm. book is, I think of it as a triple helix. Um, it is part royal history, royal Stuart history, uh, with a, a large feminist tint to it. Memoir, mm -hmm. irreverent memoir, and my travels through Britain, through mm -hmm. Mary's spaces. Yeah. So you've got a lot of things bundled into a lot that. Of things uh, going on, you know? I, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah, and so you talk about. Uh, I, I like this. So you told me that your book was a fascinating account of the late Stuart monarchy, the progression of feminist history, and the unexpected connection between the two. Yeah. I don't want to give any yeah. away, but right, right. I, in my research, I find a, a strong connection um, to Mary of Modena and the early, um, an early European feminism. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's so much fun when you find something you were not looking for when you are. Oh, yes, it is. And I love history. I just love history. And historical fiction is one of my favorite things to read. Um, and, you know, back in Renaissance Europe, mm -hmm. I mean, being a woman was kind of a handicap. There were strong women, you know, of course, Queen Elizabeth and Eleanor Ab Aquitaine, and there were some others, right. but they always had to fight against the men in their lives in order to have any power for themselves. And I think we have come a long way. Absolutely. And so it's interesting to me that you found a group of women writers yeah. way back then. I know. I was so excited. Um, I rushed my professor with a, a book idea, and he created a bibliography for me to pursue once I got back to the States. Mm -hmm. I did. But I, I wanted to, I needed to sense Mary's spaces um, to mm -hmm. really get into the, the book in the way that I wanted to. And so I was able to return. And that's excellent. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah and did you, did you say you went to Oxford? Did you actually physically go to England and go to Oxford? Yes. I was there for a summer term. In, Li in Lincoln College, one of the many mm -hmm. colleges, and um, it was paradise for me. Uh, yeah. I still, I look back at, at it so longingly. I I'll go back. Mm -hmm. I'll go back. But, yeah. yeah. You know, I love going to school. I love being in college. I have two master's degrees myself, and and I would just keep going and going and going if I could, because it's. I just love it. I just love it. Uh, I was recently contacted by a current Oxford student who is doing her dissertation on women and the death penalty. And, she, you know, she called to get my input to it. And I'm really excited. My name won't be mentioned because she's interviewing people anonymously. But part of my feelings and thoughts are going to be in her dissertation, which is, just makes me so excited to have a voice. You'll know. It's there. Yes, I'll know it's there. It's, yeah, you must yeah. do a copy. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm definitely going to, and hopefully she's going to be a guest on my podcast as well. We're trying to get that worked out too, so that'll be fun. That'll be fun. So, uh, let's get back to our question about the significant event in your life that knocked you down, yeah. and how'd you pick yourself back up? Well, I was uh, in my mid twenties. I think I was just twenty five. And I had just ended a relationship with a young man. I'd gone to high school with him and then hooked up with him later. And um, mm -hmm. in, my, in my book, I named him Crazy David because I was, I was dating a normal <laughs> David at the time. Mm -hmm. anyway, uh, <laughs> Crazy David faked his death. And then, he, oh, and then he showed up at my door in the middle of the night uh, a few weeks later and took and did you think he was dead yes i did i did and i was oh i was me myself i mean he I, I had received an envelope from his family i thought and mm -hmm. he was it had definitely blamed me for everything and i was just uh wow jewish guilt man i was i was really <laughs> suffering. i was suffering to yeah. be and uh -huh. when he showed up it was like 
it's like he had risen from the dead. <laughs> and, he took, and he took advantage of that. Um, oh, that. Yeah. 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 That's pretty tough. Yeah. So who has been your most important mentor? D. D-E-E, -E, without a doubt. Capital D-E. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to return to teaching Toby um, after st my studies. And I did mm -hmm. middle school English at the most wonderful school in Nashville, the University School of Nashville. And D was my colleague, uh, my mentor. She taught social studies and I taught uh, English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were on the same team. And I panicked at the thought of her retiring. She was quite a bit older than I was. And so I tried to soak up like a sponge her wisdom, her creativity, her, her perspective on learning, all, all of that. And so by the time she did leave, I was ready. I was ready to be uh, the teacher she would have wanted, she wanted me to be. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. she's still here. She lives in Greenville, South Carolina. I need to go visit her, but she was definitely mm -hmm. my mentor. Yes, indeed. Isn't that the best uh, indication of the success of a mentor when the mentee is ready to stand on their own and blaze a trail? Yeah. Oh gosh, Toby, I get these lumps in my throat talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's special. Interesting. That's pretty cool. I do. So. <laughs> yeah, so maybe she'll be watching this podcast. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. So tell us about a turning point in your life that propelled you in a new direction. Well, when I was having all of that drama and uh, ensuing therapy, by the way, uh, I promised myself that by the time I turned 30, I would, I, I would have left Cleveland. That was my goal. Uh, when I was 25. Mm -hmm. And whew, when I was 28, April, got in my car and I left in the middle of a snow. Oh, wow. Oh, in early April, a snowstorm. And I started shoveling myself out of the driveway. Wow. Had you lived your whole life there? Yeah, except for college. I had. Wow. Well, you know, it, yeah, that is, that is pretty uh, definitely pushing yourself in a new direction to just pick up and leave and go somewhere altogether new yeah. without a plan. I had just, so yeah, I just saw my best friend from then who now lives in Traverse city, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and we were talking ab about the past and, you know, of course uh, my moving to California and she was in San Diego. So we were able to you know, mm -hmm. fight I can't even remember why I'm bringing her up. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up in Tennessee? What pulled you to Tennessee? So in California, in LA, um, I was cocktail waitressing at the world famous Palomino Club. And I waited on uh, Manuel. Um, and he was, and still is, uh, the designer to the stars. And oh, wow. Every, <laughs> especially every male performer in country music that you can think of he has designed for. So I felt for him. Uh, the timing was horrible. I had planned to leave L.A., but he was so different and unusual. And we ended up marrying. We ended up having our baby. So that was definitely a turning point, moving moving to California. Oh, I mean, if I had mm -hmm. stayed in Cleveland, I don't know. I think I'd just be living the same life. And mm -hmm. so it was to leave, and it was hard. I, I left with a broken heart. In fact, uh, it was integral, and my life is completely different. And mm -hmm. I would teach, I would tell my students as young as they were, you know, you just never know what, you know, we would, we would, we, I would be doing the road not taken with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. and I would say, you never know, you know, the way you go, how it will turn out. And I would tell them some stories um, and, and, you know, they would be sitting there listening. Mm -hmm. So it's true. It's really true. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is true. You know, I don't know how I ended up outside of Washington, D.C. It was such a fluke, but 
you know, my husband's son was going to take a job here and we decided to all move together and share a home because we wanted to be there for the grandkids. But I have been discovering over the last two years that I've been here what an opportunity it is for me to be right here at the head of government and and have want to have such a voice on criminal justice reform and reentry issues and and doors are opening in those areas and it's just That's it's just beautiful. Yeah. It's just beautiful how I a little it comes bit together. About what doors are opening? Can I Well, I I have I have been invited to several different seminars and with different reentry groups and I actually was invited to a meeting of the reentry commission for the uh, Washington DC metro area and uh, there's a lot of people in this area who are have movements to make these big organizations that really can step in and help people re-entering society and you know I I I become they're they're becoming my new network and I've been showing them the workbooks that I've created and the book that I have and the programs that I teach and it's all just kind of coming together. Oh, so so I think I'm where I need to be. It's your passion mm-hmm. project. I'm so happy. Yes, it you. is. Yeah. It certainly is. It's amazing how doors open wow. when you just follow where your heart takes you. You know, when instead of going where your head takes well, you. Well, whenever I hear that phrase, I think of Julie Andrews and the sound of music on the bed. You know, oh, yes. Uh-huh. My favorite. Yes. Piece with the children. That's so true. That is so true. Yeah. Raindrops on roses. Yes, I love that. I love the whole <laughs> the whole uh, movie. So I think that's beautiful. Was there ever a time you really felt imprisoned? And what did you do to liberate yourself? Well, it was my um, first marriage. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I thought if I didn't leave, I would get cancer and die. I really, oh, really? Yeah, I did. Wow. And just a toxic environment? Just, it was so unhealthy for me. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so I left and I moved mm-hmm. into, I, I, have a, I have a picture. I'm going to show you. Okay. Okay. You see that? Oh, yeah. yeah, I see that. Okay. Yeah. That's what I moved into. <laughs> and, my, and where was that? It's in still in, um, uh, south of Nashville, about 50 miles. Oh, so you came straight from that marriage to Tennessee. That's where you got called to come. Um, I was married. We came to Tennessee together. Ah, okay. And okay. Yeah. And uh, I just, I was so unhappy. And I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't want to hurt my daughter. You know, that's what I didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to get cancer and die either i i was really in a bit yes stuck Mm -hmm. stuck yeah you know my my husband today chris i remember when i first met him i was just a mess because i was trying to fix all these things in my life you know fix my sons and fix this and fix this and and he said toby you can't be of any use to anybody until you fix yourself yeah so Really, that was a gift to your daughter to leave a situation where you felt un- yeah, I can happy and thank you for that. I, I mean, I mm-hmm. think I've been a positive role model to her mm-hmm. in a handful of ways, but I, I hadn't thought about it about mm-hmm. my marriage in that way. Thank you. Well, you've yeah. showed her that if you're in a situation that isn't good for you, that it is okay to leave. Yeah. And, you know, Heaven forbid she'd find herself in a situation like that. But if she does, she'll know that she doesn't have to stay. And so many women don't know that. So many women stay. She's fearless, man. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a gift that both of her parents wa- wanted for her. Not just me. Mm-hmm. But also. That, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I think that's really important when someone divorces and they have children is that you do your best to keep the children out of oh, the yeah. and let them have relationships with each yeah. parent. And yeah. I'm telling you, it's, it's hard to do. I had to bite my yes. head. The time or two. Uh-huh. Yes. You know, yes, I'm why sure. You call your father, I would say, <laughs> because he mm-hmm. was her and much later in, in her adulthood, she said, Mom, I know what you were doing. 
things. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that is great. So you're, you talk about some major themes in your book. We've touched on them a little bit, and I'm just going to touch on them some more, and you can expand if you'd like. Absolutely. So we talk about feminist history, women's struggle for intellectual freedom, 17th century female authors, women accepting aging, women acknowledging intellect, and sur surviving child abuse. Can I talk about aging for a minute? Yes. Yes, let's do I call it the age of invisibility. And, uh, you know, it's almost like magic. You cross over into this land of being invisible. Um, it was hard for me. Um, and, you know, it, it was hard for me. So, uh, you know, and, and those of your listeners who are in that spot, I'm sure, can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because it's part of your identity, or it can be part of your identity. Yeah, it was mine, and and uh, for good or bad. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, when your looks start, I don't want to say fading, but changing, changing. Mm -hmm. um, it takes some time to adjust. Yes, that is true. Especially in a society that we have today where looks are such the center of everything. Yeah. You know, when you're at the counter, um, let me see, let me think of a store. Let's just randomly say you're at the uh, perfume counter at, at Dillard's. Do you have a Dillard's? Mm -hmm. Or Macy's? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Macy's. Mm -hmm. Nobody waits on you. Mm -hmm. That's... Oh, that's kind of what I'm, I'm talking about. Oh, yes, I see. Hello. Now, the interesting thing is that in my life, um, I felt invisible when I was in my 20s and 30s and 40s. And I feel like I found myself now mm -hmm. in my senior years, wow. which I am loving. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, there's bad parts. Like my hands hurt all the time. I have arthritis in them and they ache and... You know, stuff just doesn't work the same way it used to. But I have found um, freedom in my golden years, which really aren't golden, because, you know, I can say now, you know what? I'm 65 years old. I'm not going to do that. I'm right. there. I'm just not. Right. Uh, but I think it, you know, it's really a um, intentional uh acceptance i guess yeah and good, good you know i told my husband this morning i wish my hair would turn all gray what's taking it so long <laughs> so you know that's kind of interesting but um i think i found freedom in my older years because now i wear no makeup at all i just i don't style my hair i just wash it and let it do its curly thing and I just feel like I don't have to live up to anybody's standards now because I'm past that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I'm finding it kind of liberating. Yeah. I turn So it's interesting to hear that other people don't. Well, I turned 70 uh, mm -hmm. in October, right after my book is published. And Oh, wow. Isn't that so? My birthday's in October, too. I'll be 66. So we're four years what's different. Your date? What's your date? The first, October first, and the twenty sixth, and okay. Um, so I'm going to be seventy when my book is. Yeah, seventy. I don't know how I'll feel when I turn seventy because, you know, I keep thinking back like, my grandma died when she was seventy and she was old, and my dad died when he was seventy two, and somebody else died when they're and like that gets to be the time, and it's, it's like ah. it is happening. It is happening. Mm -hmm. I just, mm -hmm. I mean, the sister of a of a dear friend and he just i just found out yesterday it's it, it and you just um it just pops up everywhere people that you mm -hmm. know or or you know but um mm -hmm. i feel so proud that i am gonna be 70 when this book is yes that's an accomplishment for sure i want mm -hmm. other women to know and i'm speaking mm -hmm. women um mm -hmm. yes this and I would never have guessed you were 70. I thought you were younger than me. We'll just look a little closer. 
1953. Um, yeah. Year, I think that was the year Queen Elizabeth ascended to the throne. Queen oh, really? Well, that, that fits perfectly for you. <laughs> My nickname is Cabbage, which it was oh. what her Philip called. Yes, that's right. It is. It's uh -huh. named since college, and I love it. That's really interesting. I love that. But I, do I love that. To know, you know, that there is, there is some life after 70. There is. There is. And, you know... I think I kind of have changed the way I look at things now, too. I think I appreciate things more because I'm kind of starting to realize that, you know, when I see something that's beautiful or we go somewhere that I really love, it's like, you know, I may not have this opportunity again. I have to start thinking about uh, appreciating what I have on this day because we're not promised, lot, you know, endless number of days. I need to do that more, I think. I don't think I do mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. I certainly, so, you know, see beauty um, mm -hmm. and love it. <laughs> but I, yes. I haven't thought about holding on to a snapshot, per se. Mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty important. And, you know, I've come to really love poetry as I get older. And I think the beauty in poetry is what it doesn't say. Mm -hmm. It's the spaces between the words that you can fill in in your head. And that's kind of how I see the world. It's just like this place where I can see something and interpret it a certain way in my mind and make it part of my experience. Well, and you, you also so, want to make it a better place in the, in those holes. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. That's true. Just so cool. I like that too. So you talk about your work focuses on 17th century women. Mm -hmm. And how would you compare them mm -hmm. to 21st century women? Uh, to, Do we have it easier? To, Do we have it harder? They have <laughs> no rights. None. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I mentioned in my book, there's a, a pretty famous uh, pair of sisters, the Mancini sisters, who had to run away from their marriages, you know, and it, oh. it wasn't like um, there was a room at the inn for, for women running away, you know, it was uh -huh. so different back then. So uh, I just can't compare, really. Can't compare. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, so you would, would you choose today? Yes. I don't know that I could have survived back then. I don't know if I had yeah. strength. You know, not only did they have no rights, but it was a hard life. You had to, you know, keep warm by a fire and you had to do physical labor and you had to, you know, children died all the time. And I, I think it was a difficult time. Yeah. to be a woman. But I think that just goes to show us the strength that women have, mm -hmm. that they persevered on through hard times and are now, you know, fighting for equality. Well, and, yeah. And and there, are there are women I mentioned in the book um, who paved the way, which, you know, mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. Not kind of. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't just spend all that time on it. Yeah, and your book is uh, going to be available on Amazon and in your bookstores, correct? And, and you'll have a link to it on your website, and we'll put a link on our show notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, bookshop.org, I love to push, to plug, because okay. that way you're supporting your local bookstore of choice. Um, oh, that's a great idea. I like that. I'll put a link to them in the show notes as well. <laughs> That'd be cool. So I think that's beautiful. I, you know, I have I have worked with you on a couple of projects in the past two or three years. So I know some about your story, but I can't wait to read the book. So Thank I'm really looking forward to it. And by the way, are you still designing websites? Do you still own that company? I still do websites, so yes. I don't do a lot of them. But yeah, what was the name of the company? Well, um, yeah, just now it's just through my own okay. self, just tobydoor.com. Well, yeah. Toby was wonderful. I mean, you were so wonderful to work because <laughs> you were collaborative. I needed, yes. I needed some mm -hmm. control on color and it, it, color was something that was so important to me. And yeah. I, I love colors. You were wonderful. I just, and I thank you for that. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So is, what's one question you wish I'd asked? You know, I just, I just approach this um, as, as being completely open to whatever you toss my way. So I don't okay. have it, okay. a feeling that you left anything out. Um, oh, good. Just, you know, good luck to you. And thank you for everything you've done for me, um, present and past. So. Yeah. And I can't wait to see what your book does and how it goes out to the world and, and, and educates women. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm anxious so about it. You know, I, the room. Yes, I can relate to that. I can definitely relate to that. And advertising. Ah. Uh-huh. You know, writing a book is hard work and it takes a lot of time. And I used to think when I got my book done, that was it. Exactly. But, oh no, it's not. Because marketing the book and sharing your story and doing the author events that's a whole well, different ball of wax. We met through women in publishing. And, yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if it's allowed to just say they have a summit every March. And if yes, absolutely. If so they have the Women in Publishing Summit is a virtual summit. It's not a physical summit, which works perfectly because women from all over the world can attend. And they have different seminars. It's a several day seminar, three or two or three or four days. And they have different uh, speakers that talk about different facets of publishing. And I found it to be so, I found my publisher through that summit. And you are so in touch, right, with some of your cohorts? Aren't you in a group? Yes, we have an author pod group that is just, you know, we were put together during that uh, seminar, that conference, just randomly. And we decided we were going to click and make this work because we were all working on memoirs. And it's been two and a half years. We still meet every week. And in fact, in two weeks, we're getting together for our annual four-day retreat where that we all go to together. This time. Well, they, they're all coming here to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and we're renting our historic town home, uh, townhouse. And we're doing some things around here. But last year, we went to Maine and rented a beach cottage on the beach. So we have to consider when we put something together that it has to be a place that people can fly into easily. And, you know, we had a lot of great ideas, but they all would require like a three or four or five hour drive once you landed at an airport somewhere. And that just doesn't work. So I'm happy for you. Catherine, one of the women. Yeah. You know, Catherine, who's in my uh, our author pod, she lives on the other side of Washington, D.C. from me. And we get together once a month and, and help each other with our writing. And we're kind of hosting this. And we're really excited because we put together some really fun things, I think, for us to do. That's so wonderful. we're looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pat going to be able to come with her knee or no? Is she in your? Uh, Pat? Yeah. No, Pat's not in our group. Uh, Pat Gold? Yeah. Gold. Is that who you're talking about? I thought she yes. was. Yes. No, she's not in our group, but. I do. She actually, she's on. She's one of my podcast guests too. So I've interviewed her for the podcast. But yeah, no. So we are in it yeah. together. And I've uh -huh. I've met with Pat a couple times. We've been able to meet. Yes, I've seen that on Facebook that you've gone to some of her author events, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. It's all good, man. We got. Yeah, she's pretty great. But she's coming up on another episode of my sim uh, work podcast. So. I can't wait to share her story, too. So is there a question you'd like to ask me? Mm. Well, I would like to hear more about the activism in Washington. But mm -hmm. I don't know. That, is there a particular question mm -hmm. I can ask about that? Or I guess I would like you to keep it updated. <clears throat> If that's possible. Yes, I'll do that. I'll do that. So the, the commission that I went to, that I was invited to come to, um, they meet in front of Congress and talk about issues. So when con Congress is contemplating some criminal justice bill, they're invited to come and, and give a perspective from the point of view of incarcerated people. So, uh, you know, I am not going to join that group because I feel pulled in a little bit different way. 
but I'm still in contact with them. So if I, you know, something comes up like perhaps the death penalty, which I have a very strong opinion on, um, you know, I can still get involved at, when something like that. So I, I just love the opportunities and the doors that are opening here. So I feel like I can really make a difference. That is fantastic. Were you in mm -hmm. was, was it Kansas where you were before? Yeah, Kansas City. City. See, mm -hmm. now the, this wouldn't happen in Kansas. No, no it would not. It it's certainly not. Anymore, Dorothy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and there's parts of me that really want to go home. You know, I miss Kansas City. I especially miss being able to watch the Chiefs football games. And, you know, yesterday they weren't here because Baltimore's team was playing. So they aired that game. And it's like, ah, I just want to be home. But, you know, I'm making some differences here. The Royals. Are you a baseball fan? I love, I like the Royals, too. But I'm really a football person. But, yeah, the Royals and the Chiefs both. I root for both of them. But I still football's watch, my game. I still watch almost every Cleveland baseball game on my laptop. Oh yeah, I bet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a. Con I didn't think about trying to find them on my laptop. I'm gonna have to check into that. You go. So that's pretty MLB, cool. Be go to MLB TV. Okay. And you can okay sign up the wolf for next year, um, mm -hmm. and you can watch every game. Wow. Well, I'll have to think about that. Yeah. I'll have to see if that might work for me. Not too expensive. So, yeah. Cool. Well, what's one word that inspires you? Oh, my gosh. One word that means resilience. Resilience. That's a powerful word. I like that. Yeah. 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 Resilience is a good one. It's an important word. It is important. Well, uh, Susan, thanks so much for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing how Rain Dodging does when it makes its entry into the world here. Uh, your podcast is going to air after it's already released, but uh, for those who are wondering, it's like about a month away from being released. So we're really excited to see that come to fruition, and uh, what an accomplishment. You know, every time one of the women that I've met through different groups I've joined gets their book published it just feels like almost like the birth of a child it's okay. so much work and effort went into it and so many hopes and dreams and and then here it is yeah and it's it's just beautiful thank so congratulations on your publication thank you toby you're welcome thanks susan Have, we'll talk in a little bit thank you for joining me on fierce conversations with toby your support and listening means so much to me, and I hope today's conversation makes a difference in your world. If you would like to support this podcast, there are many ways to do so. I found these ways tend to help the most in getting our message out into the world. Number one, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to or watch this podcast. If you can leave a five-star rating or a like on this episode on YouTube, that helps even more. And if you leave a comment or a review, that helps the most. The next way you can support Fierce Conversations with Toby is to join our Patreon at patreon.com slash fierce conversations. All tiers come with a downloadable digital gratitude journal created by me and membership in a private Facebook group that I also lead. Most importantly, 10% of all proceeds from your subscription will go directly to donating my workbooks to women in prison. Finally, sharing the link to this show with your friends, family, and anyone who wants to listen is appreciated more than I can say. Thank you again for joining me today and supporting this show by listening to it and sharing it with friends. Fierce Conversations is created and hosted by me, Toby Dore, produced by Number 3 Productions. The theme song that you're hearing now, Groovin', was composed and arranged by Lisa Plass. Lisa also plays the flute for the theme with Carolyn Parody on piano and Tony Ventura on bass. Find out more at tobydoor.com. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby. Escape your prison.